Chris, you may begin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Cram. I'm a director in the Department of Communications for MCPS, and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are joining our FY24 Recommended Operating Budget Forum. This is the second of three in a series where you can join us and learn about the process by which the recommended operating budget for the school system, the largest in the state, one of the largest in the country, is made. Um, a couple of quick operational notes. Uh, you saw the directions as you joined for how to access language interpretation. We do have some very important folks who are with us tonight to make a quick presentation, but then we're here to take your questions. We can take your questions. Um, uh, if you're an attendee, simply raise your hand. I'll try to go to you in order and we'll promote you to the program, bring you up to participate and ask your question. Alternatively, you can also simply put your question in the Q&A function and uh, staff, a colleague from my office, Ms. Aisha Bo, will be uh, curating that space and we'll go to her and get those questions answered as well. So that's enough for me. Let's quickly go to our first presenter, our superintendent of schools, Dr. Monifa McKnight. Dr. McKnight. Thank you, Chris. And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our second budget community conversation this evening. Um, I know there are a ton of things that everybody's planning to do to get prepared for tomorrow and the rest of the week, but I am so grateful that you've spent some time or have agreed to spend some time with us this evening to really talk about something that we think is really important and that is how we fund our school system. Um, before I get into uh, the, the presentation, I do wanna make sure that I, I share with you, I will be co-presenting uh, our conversation tonight with a few others from my team. I'd first like to introduce you and you can just give a wave, Brian, to our Chief Operating Officer, Brian Hall. He's with us this evening. We also have our Associate Superintendent of Finance, Rob Riley. We have our Assistant to the Associate Superintendent in the Office of Finance, Tom Clouthy. And we also have our Supervisor of Budget, Yvonne Alfonso Windsor. And so we will spend some time with you this evening and I am grateful for them uh, working to make sure that the conversation that we're bringing forward to you today or to this evening is a meaningful one. And our hope is that by the end of this conversation, you are one, better informed about the budget process for Montgomery County Public Schools, and two, can actually better understand how it is that you, be, you can become involved or be able to share your interests as it relates to our budget. I also want to begin by giving thanks to those who um, allow us to do this work on behalf of our students, and that's our Board of Education members. I know many of them are here this evening. I also know that our president of the Board of Education, Ms. Brenda Wolf, is here, and I want to thank her and others for joining us this evening. So um, I do want to recognize that, again, you could have spent your evening doing many things, but uh, to be able to come tonight and hear about the investment in our school system and our commitment towards the future is really important. Um, and so I thank you for being able to spend some time with us this evening to talk about that. But before I go into budget, um, I always say, let's talk about the things that are at the top of everybody's mind. Um, I know today has been, it was a, a very eventful night, I would say that came into the morning. Um, and before I get into the conversation, I just wanna take a moment to address our system-wide closure that our students, families, and staff experienced today. And I'll start by saying every time we have to close our schools unexpectedly. I wanna first up front say that I know that it is difficult for families and I know that it is hard to plan for those things that, that we just are unsure of, but always know that as we make these really tough decisions, it is always in the best interest of our students and staff. So just a quick recap. Um, yesterday, I, as you all know, if you were looking at the news at all, you're probably abreast of what's happening, but just to make sure we're all on the same page about what happened, it was about 5.30 yesterday afternoon, um, yesterday evening, when we learned that a small plane, uh, airplane with two people on board had crashed into a high voltage power line area near Montgomery Air Park. And so fortunately the pilot and there was a single passenger um, that were in the plane and survived, but they were in that aircraft for more than seven hours. So of course, the minute that we had gotten word about this happening, and of course, we knew that many of our employees uh, you know, were there experiencing power outages in Montgomery County, we as a leadership team started collaborating with our county partners, and we really met through the night to receive hourly updates. So if we don't look as fresh as we normally do, 
just know that is because we spent a lot of our time yesterday evening into the night, into the morning collaborating. So at about 11.15 last night, um, information was coming to us um, and we were in collaboration with Emergency Command Center and PEPCO and trying to confirm a timeline of when power was gonna be restored. Well, as you know, um, as, as anytime we have something that happens for the first time, you know, everyone was working through the situation. Um, at one point we were told that restoration of power may not happen until 6 p.m. today. Um, and so we knew that Montgomery College had announced its closure at this time. And what we were looking at in Montgomery County was 44 schools that were without power, five central office facilities that were, that were without power, two of our bus depots, um, and staff were attempting to assess computer networks for all of the systems that support school operations. I mean, there were so many factors that that went into this that, you know, really had us really concerned about being able to operate with all of these power outages as of yesterday evening. Um, last year in the winter, one thing that we tried to make a commitment to was to help make sure we were able to communicate with our families earlier so that if there is a disruption in the school day, our parents can plan for it. And so that was the information that we had. We had a number of outages. Traffic lights were out throughout the county. And I have to say, they're not all still working. You know, I've been in the office today, this morning, and there's, you know, a couple of traffic lights right around our office that still are not working. And of course, all of that was just taken into consideration as we were significantly concerned about the safety of our students, specifically the safety of our walkers, and drivers um, in a large school system. So the decision was made to close um, our schools and offices. And although many of our buildings did end up having power um, earlier this morning, the connected impacts of, of, of a number of things, food and materials distribution disruptions, um, operations at two of our depots, which at the time, you know, with our bus depots, we weren't able to pump diesel fuel. We just had to make that decision and so, um, with all of that said, you know, we, we, we worked with the information we had at the time. Um, and quite frankly, after those widespread uh, outages today, we actually spent the time assessing all of the buildings for their safety and readiness. And of course, every time we have a power outage like that, we are really impacted in all of our buildings by heat, water flow, and all of those things, connectivity, all of that. So all of that work was done throughout today. So this work was complete today and tomorrow we're gonna to be fully ready to open and receive our students with open arms and happy to see them tomorrow um, on Tuesday, November 29th. So I just wanted to say that we recognize the disruption in any operations is inconvenient to our families and we do appreciate your ongoing support and understanding. Um, but always know again that our, our primary goal is to make sure that we are protecting the safety um, taking safety precautions to make sure that our students and staff are are okay and the conditions are right for them. So again, thank you. We appreciate you. I mean, look forward to welcoming our students tomorrow. So with that, let's go ahead and jump right into the budget conversation. So um, tonight, again, I'm going to try to share information that's very simplistic with you um, so that Again, you understand much of the overview of our funding, how we're funded, how we utilize that funding in Montgomery County Public Schools, and all the things that are taken into consideration of the process of getting the school system's budget approved over um, a series of months. So um, before we get any further, the first thing I want to do with, within this budget conversation is provide an important point of clarification to ensure that we're all on the same page. And that is to address the fact that there are two major buckets of money that we draw from in Montgomery County Public Schools, okay? There are two of them. One is the capital budget, okay? That's one budget. And the other is the operating budget. They both, I'm going to say, are very, very critical to our operations, but are very different. So I'll first say the capital budget really targets funding that has to do with construction, modernization of our buildings, our brick and mortar buildings. Um, and as a matter of fact, our Board of Education recently approved a request of $1.92 million to advocate for the re resources of our students um, who need to learn in modern and well-maintained spaces. So that's what our capital budget is all about. Think about that brick and mortar, uh, buildings, uh, and everything that goes into construction as it relates to capital budget. So that's one bucket. Now, the second budget, which I'm going to talk about tonight, is the MCPS operating budget. 
And that budget, I would say, focuses more so on what goes on inside of those buildings that the capital budget provides. So that means the operating budget covers the staff that's in those buildings. Operating budget covers the curriculum and the learning, the materials that are in. Everything inside of the school is what the operating budget really uh, covers. And so it invests in our people, our programs, our day-to-day -day expenses, and what it takes to deliver instruction and programs and services to uh, over 161,000 students in our system and across 210 schools. So that's the, that's the scope of all that's covered in the operating budget. So I just wanted to share that with you because it really does serve as a foundation for us to do the work that we need to do for and on behalf of our students. Next slide, please. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the budget process timeline. So I wanna situate us where we are in the operating budget process. So my responsibility as the superintendent, I am going to recommend my budget to the Board of Education in December. So if you've been a parent in Montgomery County for a while or a community member or a constituent, you'll know that December is the time in which MCPS has always released its budget, okay? And then when I recommend my budget to the Board of Education in December, the board will then consider my recommendations, but then they're also going to take some time to hear from the public. And after the board has taken some time to hear from the public, engage with me and the staff around all of the components within our operating budget, then it makes a request to the county in February. So the board will receive our budget again in December from me, interact with it, ask questions, engage in understanding what it's going to provide to our students and our staff, hear from our community members through public uh, hearings, public comment, whatever it may be. And but again, by February, they then make a request to the county. After that happens, the process moves on to the county government where the county executive, we all know him, Mr. Elridge, will make his recommendation and then the county council will vote on the final budget. So it goes from me to the board, from the board on to the county, the county executive, makes a recommendation, and then ultimately the county council will vote on the final budget. And then after they do that, our board will come back together one more time, and this all happens from December to June. The board comes back in June to look at how much the county has given us compared to what we asked for, and if it's needed, we make any necessary adjustments at that point, meaning take things out. If we're not funded at the level in which we requested, we have to go back and make adjustments and figure out what can we do without. Um, and so embedded along the way, I'm going to say there's plenty of opportunity to have your voice heard. You can come in and testify, as I said, give public comment, ask questions, and encourage our leaders to make the investments that our students and schools deserve. And I think that we've seen that play out in the past in a very positive way. And I must say, as a superintendent, some of our most rewarding and helpful moments have been when our families, parents, or students, or constituents come out and share with us how what we're planning for in the budget either meets the needs or may not exactly meet the needs. So we have to make adjustments. It's good to have that information. Next slide, please. And so um, let's talk about operating budget priorities. So as we look forward to next year, which is going to be our 23-24 school year, there are gonna be a number of considerations that are already at the top of my mind, okay? And I'll tell you why they're at the top of my mind. I spent a lot of time hearing from you, talking with many of you, um, and you've been asking really good questions. Um, the, the things that are at the top of my mind in terms of what we need to do to continue to move our school system forward You've been asking for them and you've been asking for them at the board meetings, at public comment. You have been participating in the listening sessions that I held the spring, the summer, and gave lots of feedback there. During other community engagement opportunities, I continue to hear from our community. And so it's no nothing difficult for me to figure out when I think about what the needs are of the school system and then how those needs fit into what your interests are. Um, and oftentimes we share the, both, the, the same interest, which is for our students to be successful and to be able to get the support that they need and the acceleration that they need to be successful. So that investment starts with us focusing on supports to the students, the schools, and the classrooms, because that's where our students' experience in our school district really comes to life. 
We're having a conversation here tonight on Zoom. We have conversations at our board meetings all the time, but I tell you, there's nothing like going into the classroom and actually seeing how the resources play out in the way that benefits our students. And so in order to build a great experience for our students, we need to innovatively engage stakeholders. And that means focusing on health and well-being, build an equitable teaching and learning environment, and invest in our people who make all of this possible. Because at the end of the day, school is about how our trusted adults are serving our children, especially those children who are relying on us most in this county. And so we must always remember that. Next slide. So earlier, I talked a little bit about my role. Um, and as I translate these priorities into a budget recommendation, I wanna be very clear in my role in all of this. And it does start, and I mentioned this and I can't say it enough, it starts with listening. And I'm always listening to you, listening to our students and to our families and to our community. And through listening, my vision for our school system and the goals I have um, really have been shaped through many of those conversations, through my observations when I go out and visit schools in the, the, the small groups that I have with staff, in the conversations that I have, even if we're not in a, a, a forum of, of, of a community forum, I just generally have conversations with people all the time about what their experiences are. Their, their most desired experiences in Montgomery County Public Schools and experiences they want us to improve. And so your hopes and dreams and aspirations for our school system are what I try to build each and every day. And so there are some things that I want to do. Those are a part of my vision. And so there are some things that I must do in order to meet local, state, and federal requirements as well, okay? So that's a part of my role as an administrator. So there's always a balance of what I wanna do and then what I'm required to do. And then the last thing that I wanna say about my role, in addition to hearing from you, creating the vision of what we need to provide for our students collectively, and adhering to requirements that are in place for me as a superintendent, I wanna say that finally, I'm your advocate, okay? Once we submit the budget, I specifically build coalitions to fight to get our students the dollars we deserve. And we have many powerful coalitions in Montgomery County, um, but I can't do it alone. I need you in that advocacy with me and with our school system. And when you leave here, you will have the knowledge that allows you to be able to know what it is that you need to use in that knowledge to have the power to be able to fight for the dollars that our students need, okay? And so I think that's really, really important for us to, to, to think about because as we get into a budget every year, one of the visions behind us doing community conversations is specifically because we wanted to be able to engage our community in understanding the budget versus just coming out when I'm releasing the budget in December. And then from there, you know, just expecting you to support it. But we want you to know how we came up with those things and why they are important and most importantly, how they're gonna make an impact on our students. So I wanted to um, stop there and just take a quick pause to see if there are any um, questions as we go to go next to um, Mr. Hull, who's gonna talk a little bit about breaking down the budget. So, um, hello everybody, this is Chris. There are questions coming in, quite a few in the okay. Q&A, and we can take care of some of that now, but. Uh, we're trying to go through them and get them in order. Um, maybe we could go to Mr. Hull first. Is that okay? I am fine with that. If we want to have Mr. Hull do a, a couple of slides and then we can give you all a chance to organize and then let's quickly get back to the questions that are in the chat because we do want this to be meaningful for the audience. Okay, very good. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And thank you everyone for being here, taking time out of your busy schedules uh, this evening. So I'm gonna go through a couple of slides here um, that talk a little bit about how the budget changes from year to year. Next slide, please. So as we look at next year's budget for the fiscal year uh, 2024, we are fortunate to be starting from a solid foundation. Uh, in this current year, the school year we're in now, we're be benefiting from about 5% more money than we received the year previous thanks to an approximately $138 million increase in funding that we secured from our county council last year for this fiscal year budget. Um, and we'd like to point out that this additional funding was approved during extraordinary times uh, as we were coming out of COVID. And we know the impact that that has had on all of our learners, um, especially some of our youngest learners who have never known 
you know, a normal school year up until this year. And we know that it's going to take more than one year for us to get caught up and um, get our students back to where they need to be um, educationally. Next slide, please. Okay, so changes to the budget. Um, we're very intentional about the way that we, we spend the money that we do receive. And so, um, we, as you can see here, uh, the budget increase from last year was about $138 million. And um, how we do that, how we allocate that goes directly to the priorities that the superintendent had discussed earlier. Uh, we invested about three quarters, as you can see here, about three quarters of the new dollars that we received in our people and our teachers, our support staff, our school leaders, making sure that we were getting them the salaries and benefits that they deserved and to stay competitive with other school districts. We then took the additional money and strategically invested it in the strategic priorities that the superintendent has discussed, which are achieving academic excellence, expanding well-being resources for our students, and engaging with our community. Next slide, please. Okay, so building the budget. Uh, so as we're looking at building uh, next year's budget, the budget for next school year, we start with our current year budget. Um, and then we start by making changes based on enrollment. So we know that we've got about actually more than 2,000 more students this year than we had last year. And more students, of course, means a need for more teachers, more paraeducators, more bus drivers, et cetera. Uh, and so that's kind of the first place that we start. Then after accounting for the enrollment changes, uh, we look directly to our employees and make sure that we're able to provide them with the raises that we negotiate uh, through uh, our three um, association partners. And then we take into consideration inflation and then also build on the strategic investments uh, that we believe will be the biggest levers to student success. And those new items that we're able to invest in from year to year, uh, we call accelerators, and they build on the programs that we believe have been effective or programs that we believe uh, will meet the needs of our students in the current situation. And so when we put all of those pieces together, the enrollment, the employee raises, the accelerators, and the inflationary increases, that's when we arrive at the recommended budget for next year, as the superintendent was uh, discussing earlier. And so I will pause there and see if we're ready to get back um, to some of the questions before I turn it over uh, to our budget supervisor. Thank you, Mr. Hall. And we are ready. I'm going to turn first to uh, my colleague, Ms. Bo, who's been monitoring the Q&A, who will bring forth a question. And then I'm going to um, bring forward Mr. Jonathan Thesson from the attendees and you'll have the second question, sir. All right, good evening. Um, I'm gonna start with this question first here. Is there a surplus from salaries from positions not paid this year due to vacancies that can be used as stipends for employees who are SEIU members who are part-time and have several no work, no pay days this calendar year? It's the first question. Sounds like a question that might need to go to our finance team. Yeah, um, I can I can speak to that. Um, so in an organization as large as ours, of course, there are positions that go unfilled. Uh, there is turnover uh, throughout the year. And so the way that we account for those dollars is we actually budget them on the front end because we want to be strategic about the way that we're allocating our dollars. So instead of waiting until uh, you know we're halfway through the year and then scrambling to find something to do with those dollars, we're actually including those in the on the front end of this budget process. And so those dollars, it's so about forty million dollars, are already included, accounted for um, in the budget proposal that we'll be bringing forward to the board. Thank you, Mr. Thesson. You're up next, and then uh, Ms. Bo will come back to you for another question. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cram, and thank you very much, Superintendent McKnight, for hosting this session tonight. I uh, really appreciate it. The question I have is, when you release your proposed budget, will you state using concrete numbers how that proposed budget will impact maximum class sizes? In other words, if your proposed budget is adopted, it's going to affect the maximum class size at the elementary, middle, and high school level by this number of students. I ask because 
Last year, the budget adopted did increase the maximum class sizes. It went back to the pre-pandemic levels, uh, which, uh, but that information was not disclosed during the budget process. At least when I, uh, as a member of MCC PTA and our local PTA, tried to obtain that information, I couldn't. So just ask if you could commit to, when you release that budget, I'm going to tell you, the public, what the maximum class size is, how that's going to change between this calendar, this school year and the 2023 to 2024 school year? Yes. Hi, Mr. Depp Thessen. Thank you so much for that question. And I appreciate that. You know, it's so interesting. And this is why we have to keep the conversation going because even last year in our budget, um, you know, we still have, have, have given staffing to our schools to honor our class size adjustments. What we find out sometimes is there may be adjustments that are made, and we know that there were adjustments that may have been made based on staffing needs at different schools. And it wasn't that there was a planned uh, agreement or, or change budget-wise to change class size, because we know that's a commitment to our community and that our board has made to the public. Um, and so this year, when we released the budget, um, thank you for that feedback. We are going to actually talk about some of the things that we're doing to enhance not just the class size, but the class size experience and how we are trying to protect some of those specific interests of class sizes and things that we've heard from our parents, from our teachers, and from our students that are gonna maximize the time that they do have in the classroom. So the answer is yes, <laughs> we will make sure that we circle back to that so we can be very specific with you in, our, in, in the budget release this year. And most importantly, um, making sure that we're working with our schools and um, in, in planning implementation of that successfully. Thank you. That transparency is much appreciated. You know, concrete numbers are critical uh, for the board to assess, for the public to assess. So, so thank you. For taking those steps. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thassen. Uh, Ms. Bo, we'll go to you. And I want to let Leander Uvery know that we'll next come to you. We'll promote you to participants. Stand by. All right. This next question will be for finance. It says regarding per pupil allocation, how does that work in MCPS? Is it all one total amount for every student at school at every level? And they're asking elementary school, middle school, high school. I can take that question if you would like. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Yvonne. So we, we calculate cost per student uh, overall for MCPS. But as you know, there is differentiated staffing at the schools. Um, so that differentiates the amount of, of funding at the school level by students. So it's not one size fit all. It also based on the needs of the school and the different programs that they have and, and so on. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Uberi, Mr. Uberi, are you there? Hi, Chris. It's it's a miss, but um, I am. I actually hit that button by accident, so no questions right now. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move Mr. Cho, Greg Cho, up to panelists. In the meantime, uh, Aisha, do you have another question? Yes, we do. This is a follow up to the class size. Someone is asking, how do you balance class size and the need to give teachers more time for collaboration and planning? Ah, so that's a good one. In terms of class size, we actually adhere to the class size limits, which vary based on the grade levels. Um, and and that's, what, that's what we honor and we work with our schools to do that. Oftentimes, you, as you know, and I've talked about this a lot, and we're actually gonna talk about this more in a little bit, Montgomery County is a very mobile county, and so our students are enrolling throughout the year. As students enroll throughout the year, that means that we have to continue to adjust. Um, and so we try to make sure that there is some foundation in our class size to, to take that into account. And if it's not, then we try to we, we definitely work with our schools to make sure if there's additional staffing that's needed to adhere to that, we provide it to our schools. And we've done a pretty good job over the last couple of years. Again, not perfect. Continue, always continue to think about ways to grow, but we also look at areas in which we know that the enrollment tends to go up after the school year starts and takes that in, take that into consideration as we think about where that reserve is needed. In terms of working with our um, staff to make sure that they have the time to prepare for our students, I actually think that has more to do with um, making sure there is a structure within the day so that teachers have time to collaborate. Um, and you know, just being a teacher myself, oftentimes the, the time that teachers were able to do that is when our students went to specials 
or um, you know, when there was a time in which teams are able to get together and talk about how they can most successfully uh, put practice in place to prepare for their students. And so I, I think the answer there is continuing to work with uh, the schedule and making sure that the teachers actually have that time to collaborate um, when their students are, are in specials or in other spaces so that that time can be maximized to meet the, the teacher's needs as well as the students. Thank you for that, Dr. McKnight. And Mr. Cho actually declined to come forward, but uh, Mr. Cho, if you do have a question, put it in the Q&A. We'd be happy to take it. Uh, Ms. Bo, could I lean on you for one more? Perhaps the question about federal funds. Do you see that one? Federal funds. I'm going in order here. The next one I have was about virtual. Well, then go, absolutely do that. Go, go right ahead. No problem. Um, so this one is asking about virtual classes when we have bad weather. The question reads, when there is bad weather, why can't we go to virtual school? I ask because traditionally when we miss so many days, the days that we make up at the end of the school year, by the end of the school year, we have tested for weeks and everyone is tired. Would it be better to have a day of instruction prior to testing, even if it's virtual? Thank you, Ms. Bo, for that. I'm, I'm happy to take that, especially since we're moving into December. And this is always the question at the top of everybody's mind. I do want to say that the system did send out some information, I believe, Mr. Hull, uh, some weeks ago or recently, just to get everybody caught up to speed on making sure that you know what the protocol is going to be. So the quick answer to that is, um, we actually can provision to be able to use a virtual day if, if, if needed on a weather day. Um, what we've done is try to make sure we have a system in place in which uh, we're calling whether it, it's a day in which school cannot happen. We have a criteria around that, meaning if we know there's significant power outage or things like that um, that are impacting students being able to access virtual learning, um, that, that would not be appropriate. But if we end up being in a situation in which we are at home you know, for an extended amount of time. And I will say a shout out to our local meteorologists. If, if we're going to have like a snowmageddon or something like that, we tend to get a, a, a good heads up about that. So then we can prepare our students and our staff to be able to take their devices, um, you know, have their devices and everything ready just in case we need to switch over. So um, the simple answer is we do have the flexibility to do that. Every situation is different. It really depends on what type of weather we're dealing with and what flexibility we have. Um, we we continue to, to hear from our, our stakeholders and continue to look at ways in, in, in innovatively and most importantly, ways that are helpful to our students to maximize virtual when appropriate. Ms. Bowes, and I know we're going to get to, I'm sorry, I know Ms. Bowes said there was a question about federal funding, but I believe we're going to get to that. So there may be some information coming up in just a little while in the presentation that may come back to that federal funding, because that is a question that's on everybody's mind. And it's a good question that should be on everybody's mind because we really only have another year and some months to be able to take advantage of that, so. So why don't we take one more question from Ms. Bo in the Q&A and then go back to slides, how about that? I can do that. Um, the question that had come in about federal funds was for you to qualify how much of MCPS's annual budget comes from federal funds, which is in the presentation. So that answer is coming. Um, so in that case, we'll move to another question just to make sure we're touching another topic here. Um, they are asking, can you talk about investments in MCPS um, technology infrastructure, specifically cybersecurity? and protecting students and staff from sensitive information. So I am not sure who we have from technology that can get into the details of that, but I will say that continues to be a priority for us. Um, I believe it was last year, a year before, where we had one of our neighboring counties really become under attack. Um, and, and, and so we that was an uh, opportunity for us to really look at our systems to make sure that we were set up successfully um, and that we had many safeguards in place to protect us from that. I just think it's really important um, for large systems, particularly like um, Montgomery County Public Schools, to be able to have those structures in place. So we invest and keep a, a, a investment of maintenance in place just to make sure that that does not become something that we become vulnerable under. So um, that 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 has been an investment and will continue to be moving forward in the future. Dr. McKnight, I can add to that from the technology perspective, uh, just to add to what 
uh, Dr. McKnight stated, of course, we don't want to tell or, or share all the things that we do for, for security or, the, or else we're exposing ourselves to potential um, attack. But what I will say is one of the investments that we have made this year and that we will continue to make is we engage in penetration testing with an outside company that actually works on trying to hack into our student data and our systems to find those vulnerabilities so that if there are vulnerabilities with our system, we can shore them up. And we work with them on a continuous cycle. And that is a, an organization that we are gonna continue to be working on. And as they as they find things, we identify them, we, we make sure that we remedy them um, so that we are continuing to track progress. And we also, as Dr. McKnight uh, stated, we do work with our partnering districts as well because we have had, unfortunately, up uh, some neighboring districts around the country, as well as locally, who have experienced some data breaches. So every time those things happen, we work in a cohort with them to figure out what happened in their organization to make sure that it doesn't happen here. Thank you, Ms. Sharon. Okay, shall we move on to other slides? Dr. McKnight, or you want to take some more questions? Um, well, it sounds like some of the questions are, are starting to gear towards some more information that we have to share. We can continue on. And then after that, you know, we uh, we can take another break and, and take some questions there if we want to dive into information to share more deeply. That's a wonderful idea. So back to you. The slides are back up. Let's continue. Who's next? I believe I'm next. Um, good evening, everyone. I will um, review where the money comes from and where the money goes. And as you can see here, it mostly comes from our community and from you. 63% of our revenue comes from Montgomery County. We are fortunate to live in a community that is as supportive of public education as Montgomery County is. And for that, we wanna thank you. The next largest provider of our revenue is the state who funds 30% of our budget. Then the rest, about 77%, it's federal 3%, enterprise and a special revenue make up another 3%, and our fund balance is 1%. And the questions I was asked earlier, normally our, our annual budget, about 3% is federal funding. This does not include the uh, funding that we have really received from the federal government for COVID relief. Um, that is about 14%, but it's spread out over multiple years. And we'll, um, in, in a few slides, we'll go over some of that federal funding that we have received and how it has been used and will continue to be used. Next slide. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the, where the money goes. Uh, we work hard to use the dollars that are, you entrust in our school system wisely. We spend the vast majority of our money on instruction, on people, providing and supporting that instruction. 89% of our budget is for our staff's salaries and benefits. Now, more than ever, it is that investment in our staff, especially as the number and needs of our students grow, to put us on the trajectory of recovery, rebuilding trust in our community. Um, after salaries and benefits, 4% uh, of our budget goes to a category that is called other, and that supports our utilities, our fuel. It supports our non-public education for special education students. 3% uh, uh, for supplies and materials, and another 3% goes towards contractual service, and then the smallest pieces for equipment um, you know, some of our printers are school, some of our computers and so on. Not a lot of it because most of our infrastructure for technology is, is supported through our capital budget. So in the uh, operating budget, about 1% goes towards equipment. It's mainly replacing and so on. Next slide. So as it has been mentioned before, MCPS is the largest school system in Maryland. So we're going to talk a little bit about our per pupil funding comparison. And although we are the largest school system in Maryland, our per pupil funding compared to Baltimore City Public Schools and DC Public Schools is lower. It's lower than those two, and it's slightly higher than some of other districts surrounding uh, Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Howard County, and Baltimore County. Uh, but it's pretty com comparable. It, it is not that different. But the cost of living in Montgomery County is pretty high. And as we discussed before, our biggest investment is in people. And we want to ensure that we offer competitive salaries to recruit and retain highly qualified staff to serve our students. Uh, here on this slide, also at a national level, you're going to see Minneapolis uh, public schools, which have a per pupil funding that is very close to MCPS. 
Uh, yet, as Mr. Hall, our current COO, can testify, uh, since he moved recently to Montgomery County from Minneapolis, the cost of living in Minneapolis is lower than in Montgomery County. Yes, their, their per pupil funding is uh, very similar to ours. Next slide. And we also want to note that although we are one of we are the largest school system on the state, we have the smallest budget for administration to support our schools. Only two percent of our budget goes to what administration. And and as you can see here, in school systems uh, around Maryland, our uh, surrounding counties, and around those is two point eight percent, and Baltimore City is four point nine percent. The administration budget includes expenditures for the Board of Education executive staff units, evaluation and supporting services, administrators, supervisors, human resources, technology, payroll, and finance. These expenditures affect the district as a whole and are not confined to a single school building. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, student, the MCPS student receiving services and the share of the MCPS budget uh, from the Montgomery County operating budget. So MCPS is constantly changing. Uh, since 2010, the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals have increased by 12.8%. During that same time period, the number of students receiving a special education services and the number of English learners have increased by 1.5% and 6.3% respectively. But in contrast, the MCPS share of the Montgomery County operating budget has decreased by 4%. And although um, Montgomery County is, supports our school systems, it's a decrease that we've been seeing over the last you know, de de decade or so. Next slide. Now again, we're gonna look at the per pupil funding from 2001 to 2023. As you can see here in 2001, the amount per student was about $8,804. And it was steadily going up until the recession of 2008. Between 2008 and, 20, and 2016, it remained mostly flat, even decreasing in the year of 2012. After 2016, as the economy started to recover, the funding started to increase at the moderate rate year after year. But if we look at the next slide, uh, you're gonna see that cost per student, that per pupil uh, allocation adjusted for inflation. If you look at this graph, it represents the purchasing power that the district has. And as everything gets more expensive, such as salaries, fuel, utilities, food, supplies, and the historic inflation rates that we're currently seeing, uh, our dollars are not going as far as they used to go. We also understand the impact that the pandemic has had on students and staff and their needs have increased. Yet, if we adjust for in inflation, as you can see in this graph in 2023, we're currently funded at a lower per pupil amount than in 2009. And, and that is um, extremely important to understand. Next slide, please. Luckily, we have received, and we talked about this before, an unprecedented amount of federal funding for COVID relief, totaling almost $400 million. And that funding is gonna be available until September of 2024, the fiscal year 2025. So when we start building next year around this time, when we start building the FY25 budget, we're gonna to have to take that into consideration. Uh, the funding has been used to serve the needs of our students and staff through summer school, tutoring, enrichment, mental health services that we know is so important right now, uh, food services, the technology and that virtual academy. Uh, MCPS is in the process of evaluating all these programs and activities to determine how to move forward once the funding ends. As uh, so we know that is coming and we need to figure out uh, what needs to continue uh, as they evaluate those programs. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. McManus. Thank you so much. Yvonne, um, and I must say on that last slide, she was being very conservative and she said, this is something that we have to take into consideration in next year's budget. I'll go as far as to say, this is something that we have to plan uh, for very intentionally next year because it's money that we now have that we've been operating on for the last two years that just won't exist at all, not one penny of it. 
And so as we think about that, we knew that this federal funding would come in um, during COVID-19, but you all can, can, can attest to this as I know you know it very well. Uh, last year was our second or third year of, re, of re, second year of receiving funds for COVID-19. Um, last year was every anything but a normal year. Um, while we were able to bring our students back in the fall for an in-person experience, you know, of course we were experiencing Omicron and a number of other factors that made it not quite a normal year. And so here we are, thankfully, fingers crossed, excited that things have been moving along this year in the most cohesive way, I'll say, than over the past two and a half years. Um, this funding is going to end, and we all know that while this funding is ending in another year, it's certainly going to take us more than a year to recover from the impact of all that we've experienced from COVID-19. So it's something that we have to take into consideration. And so when we think about our budget this year, of course, we're going to be moving things on from off of that ESSER funding that we know that we've put in place um, as a new part of our work. And I'll give an example, particularly around like social emotional needs of our students. We're now budgeting for that in a very different way, knowing that our students need services available to them to make sure that they are well so that they can be accessible to the learning that we have available in our schools. So that is something we will continue to talk about. I will continue to say that repeatedly because we've got to begin to move some of those things from ESSER funding into our operating budget to prepare for that clip. All right. So the next slide, I believe, is where I'm going to talk about, yes, um, key milestones for community input. Because as I said earlier, a big part of why we wanted to have these community conversations is to really talk about how we can continue to have your input, your questions, your even your comments. If there's something even you want to share with us tonight, that's something that 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 really is something that's on your mind that you want us to take into consideration, we want you to share it. So we want you to share it because we want one from this presentation for you to walk away being more informed about the process. We also want you to understand the process and then most importantly, make sure that your voices are heard. Advocating for our students doesn't mean that it rests solely with MCPS and the Board of Education. Ultimately, the decision for funding is approved by our county council. And so as we begin to take into consideration many of the needs that you have that you share with us, and we, and we include those in our budget, we also need you to know why those, we need you to advocate and share why those things are important beyond Montgomery County Public Schools and beyond our Board of Education. So I wanted to highlight the timeline so that you can understand where you can advocate and assert your voice in the process over the next few months as we go through this process. So you'll see this very much outlined here, how the process begins in December 2022, which is when I released the budget and everything that happens in between there that provides all the space and time that you need to become involved, provide your input, provide advocacy um, for whatever perspective it is that you share and knowing that you have from, uh, quite frankly, January until June to do that when the board um, does approve the final operating budget. Next slide. So here are the specific ways, you know, along the way, even more specifically that you can engage in each juncture in the process. So today officially kicks off our budget process. Actually, I'm going to take that back. We actually kicked the budget process off a couple of weeks ago when we had our first community conversation at uh, Wheaton Regional Services. It was a beautiful Saturday. We, it was an in-person experience. Um, and we had some of our community members come out and engage in understanding the budget then. This is our second uh, community conversation. And then we're gonna have our third in-person at CESC on Wednesday night. Um, so this, this whole process of us engaging in community conversations to understand the budget is what we're doing to kick the process off this year. And then we also have additional dates where the school community can join and learn more about the budget. The Board of Education is, um, they're gonna begin holding public hearings in January about the budget prior to um, sending our budget proposal over to County Council. So the 19th, which is I believe the Monday before winter break is when I'll release it. Um, you have a chance to digest, understand, and it will be a pretty lengthy presentation. And our goal is that this year as we begin to, begin to bring this presentation to you, we make meaning of it so that you just don't hear what the numbers are, but we make meaning of it, letting you know, you know, what the investments have been and 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 what how that's been played out for our students and what investments we see in the future as we plan the role of of Montgomery County Public Schools in the future that it has to have. It's not the same school system, and no school system is after COVID nineteen. We've learned a lot, and we have to build a different infra infrastructure that's going to address the needs of our students while also protecting the needs of the profession to continue to get 
as many skilled, qualified, experienced, and people who love children to come in and bring all of their expertise into the classroom so that they can be successful or serve them in all the other ways that we know our staff supports them. So the County Council is currently holding um, public forums to hear from the community what priorities need to be incorporated into the budget. Um, there is a QR code that takes you to the dates of the forum. And then in April, the County Council will hold the public hearings prior to approving the budget. So just keep those dates in mind as we move through the process. And of course, if you, you know, try to figure out, well, here's something that I want to share and what's the best format to do that, you can always reach out to our communications um, team or our staff to, to let us know and we'll help walk you through the process. So that kind of wraps it up for what we wanted to share with you. I'd like to turn it back to you, Chris, because uh, at this time, I think we can take more questions, hear comments, considerations, anything that our um, families, our students, our uh, constituents would like to share with us. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And uh, we've got some questions ready. Uh, and I did appreciate you mentioning the upcoming uh, budget presentation on December 19th. I just want to remind folks, that's always a, a great event to come and see how we uh, characterize these important investments. It's a wonderful show. We often celebrate uh, student performances during that event. So look for that communications, that information in the coming weeks. We'd love it if you would attend. Before we go to Ms. Bo, I do want to mention to everybody still with us, if you want to step forward and ask a question, I see that we have one now. Uh, please just raise your hand and we'll go to you. Um, Mr. Steinberg, we'll come to you next, but first let's go to Ms. Bo for a question from the Q&A. All right, and uh, this kind of touches on a part of the presentation that was just mentioned, but someone asked, will you share in tonight's presentation about the pandemic learning loss and how we will address this in the budget and specifically ensuring equity and quality throughout all of MCPS schools when it comes to different demographics? That is a great question. Um, and, and I'll say we've been talking about the impact on students learning from the pandemic um, and intentionally and consistently uh, for the past months, quite frankly. We came into the school year saying that we were going to be very intentional about assessing our students. We had a Board of Education presentation in October in which we shared with our community what we found in that. And of course, our budget is going to be the next step in sharing as a result of what we learned. Here's what we're going to do about it. Um, I also know that that presentation was given in October and we've had presentations up and shared with our public. But what I think I'm hearing, which we will certainly take into consideration, is when we come back on December 19th and share the budget, um, the operating budget, then we can at the same time share how those investments are going to address the, the learning disruption that, is, that has been caused by COVID-19. And I'm going to say absolutely we're going to do that. And we're probably going to continue to do that over the next couple of years until we get our students right back and beyond where they were performing uh, before the pandemic. All right, thank you. Mr. Steinberg, are you there? It's your turn. You may be trying to get his microphone on. We'll give him another moment. I'll ask him to unmute. Mr. Steinberg, are you there? There we go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. Go right ahead. I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on with my computer and camera at the moment. Um, anyway, my question is, Dr. McKnight uh, mentioned earlier on um, about maintaining and modernizing buildings for the students. Um, my question, I guess this would be a capital uh, funding issue. The school buses, are, which we transport our students to and from school, are not being maintained. In fact, they're actually somewhat neglected. There is the bus that picks up my, my child that takes her to school every day is absolutely filthy. I do not blame the driver whatsoever because Montgomery County Public Schools has no bus wash facility for some reason, such as ride on and other county agencies that have vehicles that get washed. So my question is, is there a recommendation in the in the budget for for capital improvement to purchase, install, maintain and operate a bus washing facility so that the fleet of buses in Montgomery County can be washed and are properly maintained? They look absolutely awful. Thank you. Thank Mr. you, Steinberg. Mr. Steinberg. No, I, I see Ms. Edwards is on the line, and I believe Ms. Edwards was actually uh, meeting 
with uh, a team to actually address that very thing, Mr. Steinberg. And I'm going to actually, if I have the right Mr. Steinberg, I think I'm going to quote (laughs) what I heard of Mr. Steinberg say, which was that the school bus is the first classroom that the students experience. And that is absolutely true. I I actually have taken that statement um, after hearing that, because I think that's the first time I've heard it stated that way, but so true. And I think the mo- the first experiences that our students have with our school system that gives them an impression of who we are and how much we care about the facilities that we have for them is is is, is key. And so, Ms. Edwards, I see you on. Did you want to uh, address the the follow up on that? Absolutely. Good evening, every good evening, everyone. And hi, Mr. Steinberg. How are you? And thank you for highlighting that. We do have the one facility for our buses to be washed, um, and that is the exterior component of the bus. We are looking at how we uh, continue to think about other geographic locations and the consideration that we do have bus depots in different parts of the county. And so as we continue to visit our depots and gain input from staff members, that is one piece in which we are trying to learn more about in terms of to make it more convenient, especially for the exterior of the buses. The interiors, I know many of our bus drivers, as Dr. McKnight said, that is their first classroom and they nurture that particular space. But again, we'll continue to gather that feedback and continue to move forward with kind of making it a little bit more widespread. Um, Thank you, Ms. Edwards, for that. If you don't mind, maybe we could follow up offline because I think you may have some information that's not exactly accurate as far as washing of the buses. Okay, not a problem. I'll, I'll send you an email and we can follow up offline. Perfect. Thank you. you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Edwards. Um, We're going to go back to Ms. Bo for a question from Q&A. And then Ms. Laura Stewart, we're going to promote you up to ask your question. Go ahead, Ms. Bo. All right. This next question is regarding mental health positions. The question, how will mental health positions, i.e. school counselors, social workers, and school psychologists, gained through ESSER funds be maintained once that fund ends? I can jump in here. Um, Great question. And I actually love that someone put that in the question because that means that is someone who's paid attention to the fact that those were primary positions that we have not traditionally had, particularly like the social work model, in our budget before until COVID-19. And so we did take the liberty of using ESSER funding to fund many of those positions. So earlier when I mentioned that, I want everybody to remember that the ESSER funds will not remain beyond you know, over another year and some months, that we are going to be moving over some things to our operating budget. That's exactly a perfect example. So some of those positions that we know that we will continue to need and utilize in our school system, we are moving some of them over bit by bit to the operating budget. So um, that's our way of trying to make sure that when we get to the cliff of ESSER ending, that we just have not prepared for those positions that we know are gonna be continue to be critical to our students. Um, and then I also wanna say not all mental health uh, positions are funded through ESSER. You know, um, some are directly funded uh, positions to Department of Health and Human Services by the county. So with that said, not all of those positions are funded through MCPS. So we should remember that as well. But I do want to say those are valued members of our community. And I'm so proud to be a part of a county that's made the commitment um, and understand the importance of making sure that our students' well-being is front and center to their learning. Um, And so we're going to continue to protect that. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Ms. Bo, we'll come back to you in a moment, but Laura Stewart, you're up next. Good evening. Um, My question has to do with summer school options. Um, So since we still have ESSER funds, I would like to know how we are using that, especially for some of our older kids who are taking some upper level math and there's still some gaps. And the previous year we had something called boost classes. Some of these kids might not need to take it all over again. They Their grades were okay, but they still don't have that foundational grasp. So it, it just gets harder as they go on. So I'm curious if you're thinking about doing some kind of um, boost type classes over the summer. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. And I'm actually gonna have Dr. Pugh come on to talk about that. But I wanna say 
I am glad you brought that up. And yes, Boost was actually one of those programs. You were right that we had. And one thing we'll have to continue to talk about or not talk about plan for, which we are planning for, which is how we continue to accelerate and support. So even since Boost and during COVID-19, um, you know, we've, we've come up with different ways to, to plan for that support. I feel like it's gonna be really important for us to really get to know the learners and try to figure out from them what is going to be the best uh, support system for me. Um, you know, we had the tutoring uh, available to our students and then we're getting like from some of them rave reviews that, you know what, if I meet this person, you know, online, they're able to walk me through the convenience of other things that I have going on in my life, whether it may be work or whatever, this best meets my need. Um, and if that works for students, we, for a student, we want them to be able to have that and not accrue like significant cost for that. But some of our students want that regular in-person experience, uh, Laura, you know, coming into a summer school class or whatever it may be, that's going to work best for them. Um, what, what I look forward to us continuing to do, to, to do is because we've over the last couple of years had more students than ever before engage in all of those extra learning opportunities during the summer. And let's just say it as a result of COVID-19, the, the, the magic bullet here is more time, more time to get that support that you need in the way that you need it. Then we want them to be able to choose from, a, you know, a number of different options of what's going to work for them as a learner. So thank you for raising that. I mean, the boost, the, the boost classes did get a much rave review um, from our students. And we want to continue to be able to offer options. Dr. And I know a lot of kids appreciate the tutoring too, but um, right. all those options would be great. Thanks. Yes, and I can add to that. Uh, we're just in the planning stages right now, looking at the dates so that we can make sure that we have the, the two semesters for summer school for credit bearing courses but I appreciate your advocating for the non-credit bearing courses just to offer that additional support and preparation. We're also looking at the feedback that we got that talked about people's prefer preferences for virtual, in-person, a combination, half day, full day, fewer locations. So um, I've noted the request for, for to continue the math, especially boost. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pugh, and who is our Chief Academic Officer. Welcome this evening. Uh, let's now go back to Ms. Bo. What is the next question in Q&A? All right, we have two questions that are asking similar things, so I'm going to throw it out there at the same time. The first one is asking, you mentioned as you built the current budget, you start with current budget and add on from there. So they're asking, do you have a process to examine what is currently working well and repurposing those funds before adding on? Um, and we had another similar question asking, is there, how much of the budget rather um, do we set aside if we do for monitoring and evaluating if some of our special programs, pilot programs, initiatives are actually effective and working? Those are two great questions and questions that we have been planning for and talking about, but I am gonna turn this one over to Mr. Hall and uh, Dr. Murphy. Um, as I know they have been working with their departments in, in both areas of evaluation of effectiveness of programs and uh, how do we add on to our current budget based on the need. Great, so I'll get started and then um, let Dr. Murphy um, add in as well. So very important question. Um, obviously, you know, every not only every dollar that we spend is important because we have limited resources, but the time that we have with our students is also limited. And so we wanna make sure that we're investing both our money and our time in things that are gonna work and move the needle for our, our children. And so we do have uh, a department that um, is dedicated in large part, at least to evaluation of our um, programs and, and what we're doing in our schools and making sure that those are effective. Um, and especially with the Esser Cliff coming, as has been brought up you know, numerous times on this call already tonight, uh, that is something that we are meeting on and talking about now so that uh, when we are building the budget for next year without the ESSER funds, we're able to identify uh, early on, you know, what has been working and what we need to make sure that we're able to move over to the operating budget or continue to invest in because we won't be able to invest in everything. It's a lot of federal funds that will be going away. And so we want to make sure that we're identifying those things that work and uh, investing in those. And so I'll turn that over to Dr. Murphy and see if he has anything to add um, on that. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Hall, and thank you also for the question. I'll give you uh, kind of two real concrete steps that we are taking with many of the uh, programs that we have in place. And that first step is that we are closely looking at the evaluations we have in process and then what expectations for the results that we want to see and what are what's the impact of the various initiatives or programs we have in place. Um, and so we're going to, you know, put a very close scrutiny around each of those as far as how we move forward. The second piece is, uh, and Mr. Hall and I have talked uh, extensively about this, is with new initiatives that we bring in, bring on, we are going to make sure that we have a rigid evaluation system around them. If we're not seeing the results that we're, uh, we're expecting, then we need to shed those uh, and then look in a new direction. So I think those are two substantial steps we need to take. Uh, it's really around the dollars that we are gleaning from our community, and we need to spend those monies very wisely. And I just want to add on, I want to thank uh, Dr. Murphy and Mr. Hull for that. We, we spent much time over the past couple of months, quite frankly, working with our research team and others. And some of it's resetting after COVID-19. You know, we've always had a practice of really evaluating our programs. The last two and a half years have been anything but normal. Dr. Murphy just spoke to the fact that now as we invest in new programs, uh, like for instance, we are very excited about bringing structured literacy into the science of reading. Um, for our students next year, because we've read and we've seen there being, uh, you know, uh, so much impact. But we also know that as we start with these programs, we at the beginning of implementing them are going to be very clear about what the evaluation is going to be. <laughs> so that way, uh, you know, earlier one of our our um, our stakeholders mentioned transparency. Well, we want to be transparent with any vendors that we work with, any partnerships that we develop, and most importantly with our staff and our families who, you know, know what these investments are, but at the end of the day, you wanna know, well, what's happening as a result of it. And so starting out with planning how we're going to measure that so that everyone goes into it with an understanding is something that we are excited about getting back to. But thank you for that question. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. And thank you, Dr. Murphy for joining our deputy superintendent. Thank you for being here. Um, Eliana, we brought you up to panelists. Did you have a question for us? Well, my mom's name is Eliana, but my name's Irene. I go to Sleco Creek Elementary School, and I was wondering, is there a budget for better school lunches? Thank you. Dr. McKnight, do you want to take that one? First of all, yes. Irene, thank you for getting on and participating in this budget conversation. We so appreciate you. You have the best voice ever, I have to tell you. Um, and what you are asking about has been a, a conversation that we've engaged in with so many of our students, quite frankly, over the past uh, two years. Um, and yes, we continue to invest in making sure that at Sligo Creek and everywhere else, we're providing uh, good options, healthy options, and tasty options for our students in terms of their lunch. And Irene, I did wanna say, if you're interested in, you know, we, we, we continue to do, we have a, a food work group that many of our students are a part of. And if you are interested in joining that and, and joining us in our taste of MCPS, and that's when we bring our students in to taste different menu options, we would love to have you and to have your opinion uh, considered in that process. So um, I know you know how to email, you can always, email, uh, send an email to me, someone will respond to you, or you can put your info or put your email in the chat and then we can reach out to you. But we love to have you involved in that. Thank well, you. My mom said that you can just email her um, and I would love to. Oh, okay. So we have to get Irene's information uh, or your mom's email. Irene, can, can you put your mom's email in the chat maybe? Yeah. I'm going to do it right now. Or either we're going to look for every Irene at Sligo Creek tomorrow <laughs> until we find the right one. Thank you. I'll email you tonight. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, back over to you, Ms. Bo. Irene, set the bar. You got another good question for us? I know. That was a great one. So switching gears a little bit, um, the next question is about the blueprint implementation. And the question is, could you share 
any budget implications the blueprint implementation may have on the fiscal year 2024 budget and will we see increased investments in supports like out of school time programming and supports for students? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to let the budget team talk specifically about the areas of, of blueprint within the budget, but I do want to say um, I'm so glad this question has come up because the blueprint is actually going to be one of the biggest pillars moving forward in our budget over the next few years. And it's important for everyone to know that because the blueprint is the North Star is what I'll call it, which is supposed to be the North Star that is putting in all of the effort in improving public education in the state of Maryland. And so there is much in that blueprint that is very innovative and in giving the school system space to do that. And when I think about what that blueprint means in Montgomery County and for Montgomery County Public Schools, the blueprint does serve as the floor for us. We are the largest county in the state um, and we excel on being competitive. We, we, we excel on making sure that we are getting the best and the brightest to serve our students. And in order to do that, that means we have to provide innovation in ways that allows our staff to be able to wanna to stay in the profession, enjoy the work that they do and give them the tools that they need to, to, to support our students successfully. So that blueprint um, in different ways are gonna to continue to represent a large part of what we have to fund and then what we have to go beyond in terms of the blueprint requirement. Just to give you a few examples, some of the areas that we are required to fund out of the blueprint is making sure that we're providing our teachers an increase in salary across the board. The blueprint required uh, within the next couple of years that we provide a 10% increase for our teachers. And so we are doing that. In addition to that, we're also looking at acknowledging our teachers who go out and receive national board certification. And so when they receive that certification, they also uh, are compensated for that, which is great. And then they are also compensated when they're working in um, our highly impacted schools as according to the blueprint. So those are some areas that you will naturally see that funding in. You'll also see the school system funding in areas that we have always been committed to, for instance, dual enrollment. Having our students uh, participate in dual enrollment programs at Montgomery College, it is so exciting every year when we have our students who come and it's, I call it their first graduation when they're graduating uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with credits uh, to, close to an associate's degree. Um, and they haven't even uh, uh, gotten their high school diploma yet. And that's because they've been enrolled in early college and programs like that to really get a head start. And so that dual enrollment is also going to be one in which the blueprint uh, expects us to be able to fund um, to continue to support that effort, which we've always been, been uh, uh, motivating and, and, and encouraging in Montgomery County Public Schools. So those are just a few. Um, I'll turn over to our budget team. Are there any other areas that you think are worth mentioning? Sure, I, I can add to that, Dr. McKnight. So uh, in addition to the ones you mentioned, also early childhood education um, is one of the pillars, as well as more resources to ensure that all students are successful. And as for budget implications, we know that we're going to be getting state funding. You know, a chunk of the state funding is specifically set aside for Blueprint, um, but that only gets us so far. So there will be other additions that we'd have to make to supplement that um, as Blueprint is, is, what is what it is. It's a Blueprint, but we're going to build upon that with other operating funds. All right, thank you. Uh, I think we're going back to you, Ms. Bo. I know we have a couple of questions still from the Q&A. I did want to mark the time. We have plenty of time for more questions, but there are about 12 minutes left in the program. We could go over, but we do have questions. Ms. Bo, over to you. All right, switching gears a little bit. This one is regarding sustainability. The question is, how will MCPS highlight sustainability in the fiscal year 2024 budget? to reach our goal of cutting emissions by 80% by 2027 and 100% by 2035, rather. Thank you. I don't know if we have Mr. Adams on the line. Uh, if he is here, I'll ask him to come forward. But I am going to say, we've got to release the budget. <laughs> I love the anticipation of our team tonight because you, uh, and, and this is what we've experienced in, in our community conversations before, the question, continues to come like, you know, what should we expect in terms of the investment in, in this year's budget? And so um, that's why we're spending so much time after we release it on the 19th to actually interact so that everybody and the public can understand how we're taking all of the initiatives into consideration, how we plan for that and what they mean in the budget. 
Um, so while we, we aren't prepared to talk about all the things that we're bringing forward in the release, um, I do hear that as a priority. We've heard that uh, you know over and over from our community and we've made a commitment to implement that sustainability plan um, with fidelity in Montgomery County. And that only helps our school system, it, it helps our county, it helps our state, it helps the world. And so, you know, that's that's definitely a continued the commitment of ours. And I don't know that we have Mr. Adams here tonight, but Ms. Edwards is here and, and may be able to elaborate a bit on that as well. No, just like what Dr. McKnight said, and I and appreciate the question. It is something that we definitely have to stay focused on when the budget comes out. Um, we'll be able to share information, but our commitment has really been through. We have continued to do collaboration with our students, um, really having the students be able to provide a lot of information in terms of what that long-term plan looks like, as well as um, members of our community and our staff members. So we are excited and continue to just be able to um, put in things each and every year that will benefit not only our school system, but overall just Montgomery County and the rest of the world. So please stay tuned. Okay, keep it going, Ms. Bo. What's next? Here we go. Unmute myself really quickly. When will the budget focus on less TPT positions as importance of the hiring process? It is important to pay and keep important employees such as paraeducation educators. Yes, I agree with that statement. I think every employee that makes up the infrastructure of what's needed to support our students are important. Um, tonight, we've talked about our bus drivers, our paraeducators, our teachers, our food service workers, our principals. I mean, everybody. There's no way that we can do any of this work without making sure there is an investment in, in, our, in our staff. Um, now, when it comes down to TPT, I mean, TPT does provide sometimes the flexibility that some others are looking for in terms of making a full commitment that still does allow us to take advantage of some expertise and skill that people want to give the school system without the commitment. So there is a, a space and a uh, uh, some value to our TPT employees. Um, and, and I do wanna honor that. But when it comes down to making sure that we continue to invest in what's needed in our infrastructure to make sure our students get what they need, I mean, that that that's definitely always gonna remain a priority of ours. Thank you for that. Ms. Bode, do we have another one lined up? Yes, uh, this one's a long one, but we'll start here. MCPS spent years rolling out the benchmark curriculum ending in 2019-2020. It seems the district is already planning to replace this curriculum, at which will be a significant cost in terms of materials. Will MCPS be transparent about the uh, financial costs of this budget? And what will MCPS do moving forward to avoid that? Hmm. So we absolutely make every effort and to always be transparent. I do want to say that um, one thing that I've learned in, in the conversations with our community, and I think it's important for all of us to know that is, you know, when we define transparency or the lack thereof, what exactly is it that we're seeking? Um, and, and I think that's an important part of communication, which is why I continue to come back to priority number one. Um, we always have the desire to help our stakeholders know and understand exactly what it is that we're doing because we need you. We need you to understand it. We need you to understand how it's helping your child and others in our school system. And then we, we benefit from it when you become our advocates and we are able to share the results when we're getting positive results from those things. So um, the first thing I'll say in relation to that is if there's something specific that that we that that any of our community members feel that you don't understand or that we're not being clear on, please let us know so that we can provide that clarity so that there is no misunderstanding of, of that piece. So I just wanted to, to share that as well. Now, in terms of changing our curriculum, uh, we know that that's like turning a cruise ship in Montgomery County. Um, every time we, we make change. So we try to be very thoughtful about how we do that. And just because sometimes we're adding on new programs does not mean that we're getting rid of getting rid of others. And I know there was much investment in our benchmark and Dr. Pugh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not, um, uh, I'll, I'll let you address it. Dr. Yes, so, so the um, contract that we have for with benchmark will be up, we'll be in the fourth year. So we either have to renew or we have to, uh, look at a new vendor. So we have chosen to go through the RFP process just to make it very fair and transparent. 
that we are in the market for programs. We've worked really closely with Benchmark and they have um, made many adjustments based upon our recommendations to them. So when that request for purchase goes out, Benchmark can be a competitor just as along with all of the others who meet the ESSA rating of a four or higher or who meet the What Works Clearinghouse rating. So um, it, it will be a transparent bid process to go through resources. And unfortunately this happens on a four to six year uh, rotation with every curricula um, that is a purchased curricula from a vendor. That's just a typical lifespan of uh, a digital resource. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Dr. McKnight, I know that um, Dr. Marks is in the room now. There have been some questions loosely about uh, staff recruitment, including bus drivers. I don't know if you wanna take that as part of this evening's Q&A. Sure, I see we have Dr. Marks here. Good evening, thank, thank you Dr. Marks for coming on. I'll just begin before I turn it over to her by saying, um, I think we have become so uh, strategic and um, innovative in how we've tried to address recruitment in Montgomery County over the last couple of years and we'll continue to grow. One way that we've been able to make much more progress um, in not just recruiting, but also thinking about uh, diversity in our staff. And when I say diversity, I mean diversity when it comes down to experience, diversity when it comes down to, to race, gender, all, all the things that just make us the, the beautiful place that we are in Montgomery County. But one, one, one factor that I know we've had in place this past year is, is connecting with other organizations who are able to help us uh, get the word out and do that recruiting, like with our local chambers and, and others who have an interest in making sure that uh, they work with us to make sure we have everything that we need to continue to be a successful school system. And so I know that's been a recruitment effort that we've benefited from in, in so many different ways. But I know we have our um, expert, Dr. Marks here on the line. I'll let her speak to some uh, other strategies that we have utilized to address this uh, recruitment and retention. Well, good evening. Uh, yes, what we really try to do is be very targeted and intentional. And, and so we um, have uh, recruitment activities for bus drivers. We uh, you know, partner with our departments within MCPS. And we also try to go places where we can um, get community members to uh, think about joining Montgomery County. And we've done uh, pop-ups at Wheaton Plaza and other places in the county. We also look at where we're recruiting our teachers and we go to uh, areas and universities that um, graduate more uh, students who are diverse. And we focus in, in that as well. We're also looking at uh, special ed and math and science. We have a number of um, uh, programs with uh, universities in terms of Grow Your Own. And we're also expanding those um, uh, programs as well, because we do know that um, I think it was 345 of our new teachers this year graduated from Montgomery County Public Schools. So we want to grow our own, use, uh, offer incentives for our own students to go into uh, teaching as well. I think that the um, focus and the word I would use is very targeted. And we look at the data about who we are hiring, where they're coming from. And because we go back to those places that source our best uh, teachers. And we also know that we are, um, anybody in Montgomery County um, who wants a job, we have that job in our public schools. We have accountants, we have finance people, we have secretaries, we have bus drivers, teachers, paraeducators, health uh, and wellness people, technology people. We really want to be the place that you come and work. Montgomery County is a great place to work. And might I add on to that list, we have communications positions and voila, we have a recent MCPS graduate, Ms. Yes. Bo, uh, <laughs> I did say recent, Ms. Bo, uh, who is here with <laughs> us, who is here with us tonight, you know, who's recently joined us as a part of our communications team. 
I continue to say everything that we need for the future of our successful school system is sitting right here in our school system. And they are our, our precious commodities, which are students who are sitting in our classrooms. They indeed are the future. I, I, would, I, I, I cannot say that enough. And so on that note, I also want to just add on to what Dr. Marx was just saying. We need the help of our community in that area as well. I mean, we are out recruiting. We are, you know, we are talking about all the things that we are proud of that we do as an employer for Montgomery County Public Schools, whether it may be helping our employees further their education and reach some of their professional dreams. Um, but we also know that we need our community to continue to encourage our students to say it is okay. It's actually an honor to be a teacher. It is an honor to serve children and to be a part of uh, everything that they need so that they can grow up to become successful individuals in our community. And so I, I, I continue to, to, to say to our community, every opportunity we get to say, you know, we need recruiters everywhere. And it starts, you know, in, in our, with, our, with our families as well and encouraging our young people to, to wanna go into the profession of education. And we're here ready to receive them. Thank you, Dr. McDaniel. Well, that's a, that's a wonderful way to close out our event this evening. We are a minute over. If we could just do a little housekeeping before we all leave, I want to talk. Uh, turn to Mr. Klausing and ask this question, if I may. Uh, there's more to be learned about the operating budget. Where can people go to do that? What will they find there? More importantly, how can they continue to ask questions? And I think the answer to that is you answered them. Is that right? Good evening. Uh, no, I do not answer all the questions. Uh, there's okay. a resources in MCPS who helps the, the Office of Finance uh, get information out to the public. Uh, we try to be as transparent as possible. I encourage everyone to look at our Budget 101 website. Um, there's important information there that we maintain, um, but uh, we were, are taking down all these questions that have not been answered tonight and will uh, hopefully post answers to, to the remaining questions on our budget webpage in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Clausing. And there is the operating budget website. There's our archive of those from all past years. And the one for FY24 is there now. Everything that we do and capture throughout the year, the budget year will be on that website. And you simply go to www.montgomeryschoolsmd.org and search operating budget. With that, Dr. Bennett-Lane, unless you have any other closing comments, we are over for this evening. Yes, I just want to thank everyone who came out and participated. I see we still have 105 with us this evening. Thank you so much for coming out and participating in this discussion. If you have any questions that we didn't get to that you want to follow up on, please feel free to email the staff. Um, if we don't see you before, we look forward to uh, you participating in our budget release and interacting with myself and the Board of Education through that entire process. Thank you so much for all that you do as community members, as families, as a part of the Montgomery County Public Schools community. We appreciate you and have a great evening.